Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Aloha, welcome to Condo Insider, Hawaii's show about association living, mostly condos. I was reading an article the other day that talked about 38% of our population live in some form of association, which is probably three or 400,000 people. But if you're feeling a little shaking right now going on, it's probably an earthquake because our city council is voting on the sprinkler bill down at the Capitol at the, or the Honolulu Holly today. So uh, as we sit here at this exact moment, the big debate on fire sprinklers for condos is surfacing. And next week, we'll have Jane Sugimura to give us an update where that is going. But I'd say optimistically, I think there's going to be a balance that makes it OK for everyone. That being said, we've decided to have a review of 514B, Hawaii's condo law, over the next four or five weeks to give our new board members and people who don't understand an opportunity to kind of get a general review of our condo legislation. So I've asked one of my dearest friends, Nalan, attorney with uh, Damon Key, Leon Kupchak, Haster, something like that. I can never, the names are too long. Anyway. Uh, to come and talk to us about uh, 514B and the series going over the next couple months. And welcome back, as usual. Happy Thursday, everyone. Glad to be here again. Yes, you're, you've been doing this for a long time. You kind of just review your background on condo stuff and what you're doing so we get caught up to date. Sure. Uh, as Richard said, I'm an attorney with the, uh, the law firm Damon Key Leon Kupchuk Hastert. Uh, we provide uh, full services to condominium and community associations representing uh, association as their general counsel and general matter consulting, collection, foreclosure, and also their dispute resolution and litigation matters. Uh, I graduated from uh, UH Law School. Um, and then I started my practice in the condo industry, and I've been representing associations for uh, almost nine years. Uh, I also serve on legislative action committee for our condo industry, lobbying for associations and homeowners in the state. Well, you certainly, I've uh, worked with you on many cases, uh, are very talented and very knowledgeable, and, and frankly, I like the way you're able to uh, uh, talk to clients and share with them in logical ways. You know, some lawyers practice law, which is important, but some can apply the business side to it mm -hmm. and the reality to it uh, versus the legal side to it to bring quality resolutions to problems. So I thank you for that because you, you certainly have uh, earned my respect through your, your professional ability over the last nine years. So I appreciate opportunity to work with you. And I, I got to start out this because I said this whole thing's about 514B. But sure. last year, mm -hmm. we repealed, five, not me, the legislature repealed 514A mm -hmm. January 1, 2019. Just briefly, for the 514A condos out there, tell them what that means. For associations, really, they're not much, uh, you know, you're not much more affected. It's more like the developers who want to sell those units under 514A. For associations, uh, the only exception may be one, you know, regarding uh, like 75 percentage to amend your DAC or bylaws if you're still under 514B. It would be better for you to uh, make a, you know, amendment to your DAC and bylaw to fully adopt 514B. Other than that, all the projects will be automatically subject to 514B. You don't have to worry about anything. But on the other hand, if your um, project has gone through so many amendments, you've never done a restatement, it would be a good timing to do that because for new directors or homeowners, it would be confusing for them to read like a very old deck uh, with multiple amendments. A restatement at this stage would be very clean to make sure, you know, all the provisions in one document are compliant with the statute and also reflect all the previous amendments you recorded with the state. I know when this came up before the legislature on 514A, the concern was when you look at 514B, mm -hmm. Part 6 association governance under 514B mm -hmm. applied to 514A condominiums anyway. Yes. And the legislature felt it was confusing to owners because they'd be reading 514A and they wouldn't understand that now 514B was 
the controlling document in certain cases, but not other cases. Mm -hmm. They felt after all these years that having a single document, 514B, mm -hmm. would be the best solution. Yes. Realizing the developer who still had projects under 514A would have some problems, and that's why they made it January 1, 2019, to give them a chance to clean it up. That was very true. So let's talk about 514B, and in a way it's 514A because some of this applies to everybody, and let's just talk about document, or I should say the governing documents. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of misunderstanding what the, what the basic documents are to govern an association. Mm -hmm. Forgetting the laws, we're talking about the association documents themselves. Mm -hmm. It begins with the declaration? Yes, that's how you create a condo, by filing a um, declaration with the Real Estate Commission. And so the condo is formed, theoretically, or becomes an entity as soon as it's filed. Yes. That being said, the statute has a whole bunch of requirements for developers before they can sell it or offer it for sale and, and build it and do other things. So the association may be formed before the project's even built. Yes, uh, they have to file a public report and the REC Real Estate Commission will assign an effective date. From that point on, they can start to offer sale of those condo units. And what is the primary purpose of the declaration? The declaration basically defines, you know, the common elements, who owns what uh, in the common shared property. It also defines the association's uh, responsibilities and their rights, uh, and also what are the unit owners' rights and obligations. It also talks about, you know, the permissible usage of the condo units, uh, things like that, like important provisions on uh, insurance, uh, you know, um, like other statutory elements required for a declaration. See, I've always said it to uh, make it uh, simple for people listening. Uh, the declaration is kind of what you own, mm -hmm. you know, what's, what's, what's common element, what's limited common element, what's department, mm -hmm. and what you owe. So how you pay maintenance fees and what obligations you have to pay for mm -hmm. and how that's distributed, like percentages of common interest between the apartments. And that the declaration, the sub-document under that would be the declaration establishes that there will be bylaws. Yes, uh, because the association usually run by and through the board of directors. Your bylaws will have all the information about who can serve on the board, how the board will have meetings, how the property will uh, operate, like how owners can participate in the process, uh, like voting, election, removal of board directors, and some more like set forth um, like regulations, some, some bylaws are more detailed to have regulations on the usage of the units and alterations you can make, things like that too. See, the way, as I said, the declaration is what you own and what you owe. I look at the bylaws and the simple word is governance, how the project mm -hmm. will be governed. Yes. And then the third document's gonna be house rules. Mm -hmm. And what are they? Uh, just the literal meeting house rules, you know, how things should be done, how you can use your apartment, what are prohibited, what you can and cannot do in the project, things like that. And then if there's a violation, what the board can do and what owners, what process you can follow to get notified and be heard when you have a chance to respond to those violation citations, things like that. Yeah, I've always said it's the kind of the rules so you can all live happily ever after together. You know, basically the pool hours and a bunch of rules as far as uh, you know leash rules for the pets you know and mm -hmm. and uh, all these different types of things and sometimes the board can approve them based on the governing documents and sometimes changes have to be approved by the owners on the house rules but more times than not my experience is house rules can be established by the board and, mm -hmm. and maintained by the board and changed by the board if they want to change it for some reason. Yes. So let's talk a little bit about governance. Um, we talked about you have a board of directors. Who can serve on the board? You have to be a unit owner, or there are special situations like agreement of sale, then the purchaser, uh, but the seller usually reserves certain rights that would affect their security interest in the unit. If it's a trust, then the trustee can serve as uh, the board director. If it's a company, then the company's uh, representative can also serve. And you can only have on the board one owner per unit. Yes. So if you owned two units, you could have maybe your husband and wife, rep one representing one unit and one representing the other unit. Correct. 
you know, but uh, you can't have a husband and wife with one unit both serving on the board. No, you cannot. So, you know, I had an interesting question that came to me by one of our property managers uh, just within the last couple of days. And what it was, was the owner of record was a father who had, uh, I'll use my name, the Richard Emery Living Trust. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And at the meeting, they wanted to elect his son because mm -hmm. he's a beneficiary of the trust. And if something happened to the father, mm -hmm. he would become the trustee. Mm -hmm. Is he eligible to serve in the board? No, because the current trustee is probably Richard Emery. So you are the only one who can serve if you want to. Yeah, that's what I see. Well, how about if I rent my unit and I have a really great tenant and I want my tenant to serve on the board? The statute basically prohibits tenant from serving on the board. Same thing as a resident manager or the employee of the association. Those people cannot serve on the board. Now, if I, which I do, work for a management company yeah. and I own a condominium mm -hmm. and my wife wants to run them for the board, and she's not an employee of the management company. Mm -hmm. Can she run for the board? She can, but there will be conflict of interest on certain issues. She have to refrain from participating on voting on those kind of issues, like a management contract with your company, things like that. Right. And so she can serve on the board. And actually, even I, as an employee, can serve on the board. I just couldn't be an officer. Yes, that's, that's specifically providing the statute. Because I, as an owner, independent of my job, mm -hmm. certainly have rights to the property I own and live in. And so the statute basically tries to prevent management company employees and our resident managers from serving in a role that would be a conflict of interest on mm -hmm. that, in, that, in that process. So let me ask you this. We now have a board meeting. And, you know, boards sometimes have angry owners. Can they participate in the board meeting? Yes. Uh, the owner has a statutory right to participate in all board meetings except of executive session. And executive sessions, the legal and personnel and confidentiality matters. I got an email just today mm -hmm. from an owner who was saying, my board set a policy I only can speak in the forum, which is 20 minutes after the meeting. Is that right? Uh, the statute does give the board authority to adopt an owner participation rule as long as it's reasonable, owners need to comply with that when you participate in board meetings. Right. And the statute does specifically say that they can participate on each agenda items. Mm -hmm. So we basically say to uh, owners or boards is, look, start with, uh, we're going to discuss whether we want to paint the building pink today. Uh, the board's going to discuss it first. Mm -hmm. Before we take a vote, we'll give owners two minutes to speak on that agenda item. Mm -hmm. No one wants to speak, thank you, we're going to vote. But try to provide a vehicle, because the statute says they have the right to participate on every agenda item. Mm -hmm. Try to, dis to establish rules so that they feel inclusive, which probably makes a lot of sense for transparency to give them, well, I don't like pink, I'd rather have blue. You know, so uh, it's my understanding that the meeting rules require uh, boards to establish rules that allow them to participate on each agenda item, mm -hmm. but can also allow them to put limits on it so it doesn't become a shouting match or extend the length of the business meeting of the board. And on that note, we're going to take a short one minute break and come back on 514B and the basics. I'm DeSoto Brown, the co-host of Human Humane Architecture, which is seen on Think Tech Hawaii every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. And with the show's host, Martin Despang, we discuss architecture here in the Hawaiian Islands and how it not only affects the way we live, but other aspects of our life, not only here in Hawaii, but internationally as well. So join us for Human Humane Architecture every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. Hi, I'm Pete mcginnis Mark. And every Monday at 1 o'clock, I'm the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa. And at that program, we bring to you a whole range of new scientific results from the university, ranging from everything from exploring the solar system to looking at the Earth from space, going underwater, talking about earthquakes and volcanoes, and other things which have a direct relevance not only to Hawaii, but also to our economy. So please try and join me. One o'clock on a Monday afternoon to Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa, and see you then.
Welcome back to Condo Insider. We've been talking with Nalan, prominent local attorney on 514B, which is the beginning of a series of reviews of the condominium statute. And we were talking about the basic governing documents, declaration, bylaws, house rules. We got into some governance with who can be on the board. And I'm going to now ask her, should boards keep minutes of meetings? Yes, it's required by the statute. And are owners entitled to the minutes? Yes, uh, there's uh, specific um, provisions regarding when and how uh, owners can request for meeting minutes and uh, what uh, obligation the association has to comply as to production of those minutes. How about executive sessions? Do they keep minutes for executive sessions? There's no statutory mandate on keeping minutes for the executive session, but the statutory language indicates that you can do that if you want to. And I think people should know that if you kept minutes, they are subject to subpoena if you ever got into a lawsuit. That's very true. Yeah, I mean, uh, you may be able to redact certain information under attorney-client privilege or some special privilege you have, but in general, if there is a discovery in a lawsuit, you are obligated to produce whatever documents that's within the scope of the discovery request. Well, I've seen it all the time in lawsuits where they've requested copies at executive session minutes, and then in some cases, um, uh, the boards don't keep cut minutes, and mm -hmm. in some cases they occasionally keep minutes if it's something specific mm -hmm. that they want to uh, address in writing. Mm -hmm. But there is no statutory obligation to it, and there's a lot of debate whether you should or you should not keep minutes of executive sessions. But I do know that if you did keep minutes, that the owners are not entitled to the minutes of executive session. It would only be by subpoena or you know, some legal proceeding that you'd have to produce them. So an owner couldn't violate the executive session privilege by saying, well, give me a copy of your minutes after the executive session was over. Mm -hmm. you know, so that's my understanding anyway, subject to my expert legal person here saying, you're wrong. <laughs> I'm sending you to jail for 20 I years. I agree with you. <laughs> for giving wrong information to everybody, so for everybody here. So should the vote of the board be in the regular meeting minutes? All the board voting results should be reflected in the board meeting as official association action. And that's a good thing. Yes. So you know how your people are voting or not voting. Mm -hmm. And I guess they have the right to vote in favor, against, or abstain. And they might abstain because they say, well, we're talking about the management company's contract, and my husband works for the management company, so I'm going to abstain. Yes, uh, actually the statute re requires you to make a disclosure and that disclosure has to be uh, reflected in the meeting minutes. So we would know I mean, mm -hmm. and um, uh, I saw an interesting situation where uh, uh, the, the conflict of interest thing was argued in a very unique way at an annual meeting mm -hmm. and because someone gave an owner who was a board member mm -hmm. 10 proxies and they were now going to vote for election and he was up for election. They argued he had a conflict of interest for using the proxies given to him to vote for himself. No, that's not. <laughs> <laughs> that's nice true. try, but <laughs> yeah, nice try. But that's what the that's what the argument was, you know, yeah. and uh, that uh, you, you. I mean, certainly, I'm sure every person who, almost every person who is voting is going to vote for themselves, and you would think that that owner knew that they were going to vote for themselves, and, and so he's able to vote, and that's not a conflict of interest, you know? No, yeah. And, um, and, uh, but you're right about the most important thing is it must be disclosed, it must be in the minutes, and you can't vote. Yes. I find it interesting at the last year's legislature, we had several bills trying to strengthen the conflict of interest, because for whatever reason, the legislature didn't know that provision existed already. You know, when they were trying to make a criminal penalty if you voted and you had a conflict and, and all the rest of this. And the industry's position was, well, look, the statute already covers this. Mm -hmm. But how many complaints have you had? If you look at all the mediations and the lawsuits, I've only seen one conflict of interest lawsuit in the last 10 years. You know, so why do we need to scare all these volunteers serving on the board of this criminalization? So the bill died, but it's interesting the things that come up. So how about records? Do associations have to keep records? Yes, certain records. There are specific statutory requirements. 
And can you list some of them? Yeah, for example, like of course project documents, um, like uh, uh, financial documents, uh, meeting minutes, uh, contracts signed by the association, your um, expenditure records, uh, receipts, payments that you made to other parties, things like that, or you know um, some other like a delinquency records for uh, owners and for the whole project, a reserve study, you know all those kind of things, insurance policies, yeah. Are owners entitled to those documents? Um, there are specific items, uh, you know, the statute is really clear on what you can get, what you cannot. Um, you know, most of the what we mentioned, they are entitled to it, except of the individual units delinquency uh, documents. Yeah, let's talk about that, because I get that question all the time about, well, I think my neighbor is delinquent. I want to see all the charges for him and all the fines that he's been assessed and mm -hmm. all his payments that he's made on his ledger. Mm -hmm. And we've taken a position you can't get that, that it's privacy, privacy information. That you're only entitled to a summary of those delinquencies over 90 days, mm -hmm. not by unit. So you'd know a person, a unit number, or an owner who was delinquent over 90 days. Mm -hmm. But in fact, uh, we're not going to give out their, someone else's privacy information, which would be his ledger, his payments, mm -hmm. and, and those types of things. Do you think I'm right on that? Yeah, because the federal law, uh, Federal Debt Collection Act, actually prohibits uh, you know, a creditor from disclosing a delinquent owner's information to a third party without that delinquent owner's return authorization. So you got to be really careful about that. And that's where you can use the executive session if you're working with a delinquent owner on their payment plan, things like that. Yeah, so we, we, we tell boards all the time, that or owners all the time, you can't have someone else's information. And so if you have a delinquent owner, they're going to enter into a private payment plan, because the statute provides up to 12 months on a delinquency. Mm -hmm. You know, that's done in private between the owner and the board, but that's not public information to the rest of the owners. Yeah. And that's because of the federal law on that. And so that's kind of the, the one misunderstanding. But the other question we always get is that the statute's pretty clear that if an owner signs an affidavit, and they want to get a list of all the other owners and their addresses, mm -hmm. they can get that under the statute. So they can write them and say, I don't like this or I like that or whatever it may be. But we always get the request for email and phone numbers. Well, I want their email and phone mm -hmm. number. Are owners entitled to other owners' email and phone numbers by law? No. And actually, a lot of the associations, they don't want to collect owners' emails or, you know, like special emails. That's a privacy matter. And whatever, you know, the um, snail mail address you get and the owner's names are also only for association matters. You can't use that to do, like, commercial solicitation or for political matter, you know. So you've got to be careful about That's why using an affidavit from the user would be a good idea. Yeah, we, th we think that's a good idea, that they have an affidavit for the list, and we'll give them the regular mail list, but we don't give them the email or the phone numbers, figuring that owners have a right to privacy. Mm -hmm. And um, in fact, the last thing they want is maybe someone who's angry barraging them with emails on their political cause or phone calls, you know. They, they want to just enjoy their life, and they should have the right to choose who gets their privacy information. You know, I would tell you just a quick side story is that our company is introducing a new app, mobile app on the phone, where all sorts of records and information and payment abilities exist for a wide variety of, of information that you're allowed to have by statute. What I find was interesting, there's certain features you can turn on or turn off, and they had an optional feature that we could turn on that all owners could communicate with all owners by this blog, for lack of a better word. And I said, no, don't turn that <laughs> on. And here in Hawaii, there's too many people who get upset and they just barrage this stuff with endless information. They just can't let it go. And owners are just going to get upset that they're included in this. Then you're going to have to turn it off. And uh, I think transparency is good, but I think it's up to each individual's rights to pick who they want to hear from or not hear from. Yeah, I mean, new technology does provide us with an opportunity to bring in more, you know, uh, very ways to communicate with each other. But you know, there are like boundaries that we should be careful about. So, can an owner get legal opinions issued to the board? 
Usually the legal opinion would be uh, covered under the attorney-client privilege. Uh, you know, the association shouldn't disclose it to a non-board director who would waive the attorney-client privilege. That would open the floodgate of any communication relevant to that topic, relevant to that communication. It's very dangerous. They should refrain from doing that. If there's potential litigation, that document could also be covered under the work product as the attorneys, uh, you know. I think the key word you said related to that topic, because sometimes I know boards will say, well, whose responsibility is it to maintain the lanai railings? Mm -hmm. And they get a legal opinion from the attorney and the, dec the analysis of the declaration and the law, and they want all the owners to know that. They could certainly write to all the owners and say, because of this issue, we went to our attorney and here's his opinion mm -hmm. that it is the owner's responsibility to maintain the lanai railing, in my example. And they, they could do that if they elected to. Yes. And it would only be related to that topic. It doesn't mean because they did another legal opinion on something else that they would get all the legal opinions. Yeah, it's the communication between the attorney and the client that's the privileged part. If you just, uh, you know, let's see, you copy and paste some of the contents, make in a separate communication between the board and the unit owners, then that will be a different story. How about association bank statements and signature cards that open up the uh, bank account? For security reason, you know, for those stuff, I think the association should redact that, you know, to just avoid any, you know, internet mm. crime or any, you know, financial crime that could, somebody could, you know, forge those signatures or use it in an improper, illegal way. Right. Technically speaking, the, the statute doesn't define bank statements and signature cards. We've taken a position to redact those things versus mm -hmm. um, uh, not giving them because there's not really much to them. But you know, on bank statements, you get electronic information, bank account information, mm -hmm. signature cards, you get signatures, who's the authorized signers, and, and cyber crime's a big problem today, so mm -hmm. we are very cautious about that. I know we're getting near the end of the show, so I'll ask you one more, and that is, um, who's responsible for paying all this? The owner, the requesting owner, you need to pay for the reasonable copying and an admin charge. Uh, but the association should let you know 10 days before charging you that whether you want to incur the uh, the cost. If the owner decides, oh no, I want to withdraw my request, that's fine. If you want to proceed ahead, then uh, the managing agent or the association they can charge a reasonable fee. Uh, that's uh, there's a ceiling of one dollar per page. Yeah, the thing I found most times, you get an owner who's angry. And so he'll say, I want all of the records. He'll take everyone listed in the statute for the last 10 years, instead of thinking what they're really trying to accomplish. But mm -hmm. to be candid with you, if you tried to copy that, a dollar per page, it would be thousands of dollars, you know. We suggest they request the boxes, come down and review them in the office. And there may be some retrieval costs and some other admin costs related to that. But just to get angry and throw the dart of I want everything, it's probably not going to be as helpful if they don't really think through what they're trying to get. But anyway, I want to thank you again for being on Condo Insider. We are going to continue our show at 514B and trying to highlight some of the major parts of the law. Uh, see, the earthquake has stopped, so I guess the city council has done something on sprinklers. And we'll know more about that next week with Jane Sugimura. Thank you for watching Condo Insider.